American politics are escalating so quickly that sometimes it's a challenge to keep up. This has been true really ever since 2015, when Donald Trump emerged on the scene and completely upended the Republican Party, for the better, and went on to win the election. But even since Trump's election and inauguration, things seem to be escalating at an increasingly rapid pace. Things are falling apart. Americans are increasingly divided, atomized, and weaponized against each other. Now, that's all a narrative you could hear from Fox News or Rush Limbaugh. They'll tell you that Americans are increasingly divided, but they won't really tell you why. They won't touch on the idea that the American nation we once had is long gone, and instead of a nation, the United States is now an amalgam of diverse people with diverse interests, and our only commonality being that we live within the same geographic borders. Today's video will be more serious than most. We're going to trace the history of national fracturing that has been occurring throughout the Trump administration, and we're going to look at how the left is really getting ahead of themselves, potentially biting off more than they can or want to chew. And we'll also look at where all of this is going, and in response to some recent polling and growing national concerns, we'll answer the question of where the US can and should go from here. But before we do all of that, let's talk quickly about your online privacy and security. It is now summer, which means you're probably thinking about taking some time off from the work site and going on trips or vacations. Unfortunately, those that would steal and misuse your private information are not taking a break for summer. Everything you transmit over a wireless router, whether it's public or private, is subject to being recorded, logged, and archived by entities public and private. The free Wi-Fi at the airport, free Wi-Fi at the restaurant, or free Wi-Fi at your university. None of them are really free, and the price is your privacy, with every site and service you access being logged and watched by someone other than you. That's why I recommend all of my viewers use a VPN, or virtual private network, whenever you go online. So fortunately, my friends at Virtual Shield have built a service that will keep you protected on every device, from your iPhone to your desktop computer, for less than the price of a cup of coffee every month. Virtual Shield's VPN technology keeps you secured and private online, and unlike those free VPN services, they don't log and sell your browsing data. Plus, with servers across the globe to choose from, you don't have to worry about your connection being slowed or throttled. Regardless of whatever country you're in, you can pick servers worldwide to browse the internet from something that I know our European friends will appreciate. Visit hidewithjames.com to get Virtual Shield's exclusive summer deal, full-fledged VPN protection for less than $3 a month. For $2.75 a month, you can be protected and secure online. At this point, there's no reason not to have it. Visit the website and get protected today. Threats will always be out there, but this deal won't last forever. Trump is a Nazi! Trump is a Nazi! Trump is a Nazi! The story of leftist escalation really begins during and shortly after the 2016 election, wherein pundits and activists repeatedly referred to Donald Trump and his supporters as Nazis. Nazi this, Nazi that, everybody the media doesn't like is a Nazi. Of course, we know this isn't actually true. Nazi has become a completely meaningless term, used by the left and the media to denigrate, smear, and attack any white person with political opinions they don't like. Now, during 2016, the leftist escalation primarily manifested itself just as language. There were violent outbursts before 2017, of course. Black Lives Matter burning cities and shooting people in 2015, violence started by leftists at Trump rallies and other Trump supporters in 2016, combined with heated anti-white rhetoric, but we didn't really see the mainstream left begin endorsing this behavior until 2017. In January of 2017, I was in Washington, D.C. with some friends outside the alt-light Deplorable rally the night before inauguration. This was when Antifa was still a relatively new thing, and I don't think any of us realized how serious the threat was at the time. Anyways, during the chaos at the event, as we were leaving, I was hit from behind by an Antifa member wielding a flagpole. It's all captured on video, which I'll be showing here. Predictably, the police officer that watched the assault take place did nothing about it and let the attacker go free. I ended up in the hospital getting several stitches and thankfully no serious damage was done, but if I'd been an older or younger person, the damage could have been severe. The next day, Inauguration Day, Richard Spencer was punched in the face while giving an interview on a street corner in Washington, D.C. From here, the punch a Nazi meme was born. The self-described journalists of the left took to Twitter and their corporate-funded news sites to wax poetically about how beautiful it was that Richard Spencer had been punched by an Antifa leftist. From the foreword came this piece, which referred to a fact sheet published by a rabbi that concluded, yes, in fact, it is okay to punch people with whom you disagree in the face. The rabbi cited a great deal of vindictive, violent scriptures in his defense of assault on innocent civilians, almost as if this form of law is not really compatible with Western or American law. Really makes you think. 
I'll include all links to all of this below in the description. Of course, this is just one ethno-religious perspective. For Americans that believe in Western conceptions of free speech and free discourse, the values professed by this rabbi are wholly alien and foreign. But that hasn't stopped the left from taking the punch a Nazi meme and running with it. These tweets are primarily from 2018. But here are some headlines from throughout 2017 of leftist media outlets rallying around the idea that yes, it is okay to punch Nazis. Of course, when you determine that it is now okay to punch Nazis, Nazis, this presents a problem. How do you determine whomst is and is not a Nazi? I did a whole video about this topic when the story was hot, and I'll link that below, but basically the problem boils down to subjectivity. What a radical, soy-infused, bugman leftist sees as a Nazi may really just be a normal conservative Republican. In fact, that's true in most cases. Of course, unprovoked political violence is not okay against anyone, whether you're Richard Spencer or Michael Hayden. It doesn't matter. Many leftists are raised on comic books and Hollywood movies and have a fantasy of fighting for justice against the fascist state. We know they envision themselves as Hollywood heroes fighting against the looming specter of Nazism. They're addicted to the dopamine rush they get when they punch, dox, or get a so-called Nazi fired. The left has taken on a mindset of total war against their political opposition. It's no longer enough to disagree and to try to win an argument. Now, the left relies on strategies like violence, denial of service, doxing, and harassment to achieve their political ends, silencing their opposition. Instead of debating the right, they get our podcast thrown off of SoundCloud. They investigate to find out our identities and expose our family's identities. They harass our employers and advertisers in an attempt to make us suffer financially. And yes, when they can, they engage in direct physical violence. They don't want to just beat you in an argument. They want you dead, starving, unemployed, and cut off from your family and society as a whole. I'm not going to say the leftists are the real fascists, because they're not, but they certainly are authoritarians. Their strategy relies on leveraging the power of social shaming and access to corporate services in order to force the right out of the public space. We don't have to rehash the thousands of Twitter bans, SoundCloud bans, PayPal bans, Uber bans, innocent people doxxed, families destroyed, lives ruined, websites deplatformed, and so on. If you've been paying attention, you know how this is all going. The left wants to crush their opponents in every way, and this urge is a lead driver of the political escalation we're seeing. We really saw this heat up after Charlottesville, where dozens, if not hundreds of people, were doxxed for simply attending a political rally. My own family was harassed by the media, until I proposed to the journalists doing the harassing that perhaps their families would appreciate being photographed and interviewed and having their information published across the internet. They stopped calling pretty quickly. But since Charlottesville, what has changed? The alt-right, nationalists, and identitarians have almost entirely pulled back from public rallies and activism. Of course, the majority of people on the nationalist right are, as Trump said, fine people, and certainly not the Nazi boogeyman that the media wants, and leftists are titillated about punching in the face. What's happening now is pretty simple. The demand for so-called Nazis is outpacing the supply. The left's addiction to deplatforming, denial of service, harassment, and ultimately violence still needs to be fed, but there simply aren't enough so-called Nazis out there. Unless, of course, you begin to count anybody that works for Trump or supports Trump as a Nazi. And logically, why wouldn't they? The media has been working overdrive since 2016 to convince everyone in the country that Donald Trump is literally the second coming of Hitler. The pundit class loves nothing more than to compare the actions of the Trump administration to the actions of the Third Reich. So now it should be no surprise that the left is employing their docs harass the platform tactics against members of the Trump administration. Just this past week, White House aide Stephen Miller was harassed while eating dinner at a Mexican restaurant, but that wasn't where it ended. The media, specifically Splinter News, thought it would be appropriate to punish Stephen Miller's personal cell phone number on Twitter. And that wasn't all. Leftists are now targeting Stephen Miller's home, protesting outside and distributing wanted flyers to his neighbors that accuse him of kidnapping children and crimes against humanity. The left even had the nerve to use the hashtag civility on Twitter to describe the incident. What is civil about occupying the area around someone's home and harassing them to protest? Miller was not the only target, by the way. DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen's home was targeted by protesters as well, who played audio of crying children and held signs accusing her of kidnapping while they chanted and protested. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, press secretary for the president, was forced to leave a restaurant in Virginia after the owner decided she couldn't stay there. But there's more to that story, too. The owner of the Red Hen then stalked Sarah Huckabee Sanders' family down the street to another restaurant and made sure that her family was heckled and protested at that location as well. What we're seeing isn't just a breakdown in civility, as many conservatives are complaining. It may very well be the beginning of a soft civil war that has the unfortunate possibility of getting very, very hot. 
According to recent polling by Rasmussen, almost 60% of all Americans fear that anti-Trump activists and advocates will resort to violence. According to the same poll, 31% of Americans believe that America is headed for a second civil war sometime in the next five years. It's not like the left hasn't been trying to kick this off for a while. Remember last summer when several members of Congress, including Majority Whip Steve Scalise, were shot by an anti-Trump activist? Or when Senator Rand Paul was attacked at his home by an anti-Trump activist? The left has been using violent rhetoric, directly encouraging violence, and actually engaging in violence throughout the entirety of the Trump administration. It's no surprise that people are increasingly feeling like our country is tearing apart at the seams. But why is this happening? What happened to the America, the idyllic America, that our parents and grandparents grew up in? Well, much of our present division has to do with the death of the American nation. A nation is defined as, quote, a large aggregate of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular country or territory. For a country's first 150 years or so, this was an apt description. Americans were united by a common European descent, a pioneering history, a free Western culture, and the English language. America of the 1950s certainly checked all the boxes to qualify as a nation. But since the 1960s, we've changed. Our country has changed. With the passage of the 1965 Hart Seller Immigration Act, the bulk of America's immigrants now come from Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. No longer do they come from Western, Northern, Central, and Eastern Europe. America has gone from being a 90% European-American country to an approximately 60% European-American country. And with that rapid change in demographics has come a rapid change in our country's descent, history, culture, and language. We are now a diverse and divided country where different groups compete with other groups for resources and political power. Nothing unites the first-generation African migrant with the working men and women of the Midwest, aside from perhaps a passport and a piece of paper. The point being, there's nothing that unites Americans together anymore, not even the national flag or anthem. And in an increasingly diverse, divided, and atomized society, the only way things can change is for the worse. The media has incited so many on the left to believe that they are in a deathly struggle against fascism. And that is dangerous. Because when they begin thinking about our political situation in terms of life or death, they will become much more willing to act out violently if they feel justified. So how can we heal the divides, so to speak? Well, to be honest, I don't know if we can. But what I do know is we need to start taking our own side and purge this sense of radical individualism from our thought processes. It's time to start acting as a collective for the benefit of the collective. If we don't, the only other option is surrendering our country and the last remnants of our nation to the violent, radicalized, unintelligent mobs that seek to destroy our civilization.